welcome everybody to our um, third seminar of the series of uh, gravitation, gravitational waves at CQS. Sorry. So today we have the pleasure uh, to hear uh, Professor Levitsky. I'm sorry, <laughs> from University of Basel. So he obtained his PhD from the same university in 2016. And since then, he has been employed at the University of Adelaide, then King's College London. And he is an expert exactly in um, the study of gravitational wave signals from uh, cosmological phase transitions. So this is, of course, a hot topic. And most interestingly is uh, how to distinguish them from uh, astrophysical uh, backgrounds. Because, of course, we would love to uh, have signals from theories um, that predict these kind of uh, waves. But we uh, still are not, not sure how to disentangle them from astrophysical backgrounds. So uh, I think we uh, will enjoy today's seminar uh, because we are going to hear from the search of cosmological phase transitions through their uh, gravitational wave signals. So please start and thank you again for accepting our invitation. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me and then thank you for the, the introduction. Okay, uh, so let's begin. Let's start with a short plan of the whole talk. So, uh, well, I'll start with experimental prospects, which in my mind uh, also serve very well uh, as motivation to do this kind of research. Uh, then I'll go through, as, well, very briefly, I assume there are better experts than me on the topic in the room, but astrophysical sources and their stochastic foregrounds just to try and uh, show you what impact this might have on our searches for um, backgrounds from the early universe. And then I'll go on to the actual sources that I want to talk about, which is uh, first order phase transitions, first uh, in a quite general way, then the topic which is, um, say, maybe a little bit difficult and not talked about as much as other parameters of the transition, which is the, the bubble wall velocity, which will finally allow us to uh, predict how the gravitational gravitation wave spectra from such transitions should look like, and then we'll be able to uh, reach some conclusions. Okay, so to start with experimental prospects, uh, these are not really prospects. This is the what we currently have available in terms of the abundance of gravitational waves as a function of frequency. Uh, so this is the usual picture. As I said, this is what we currently have. Uh, that's why it, doesn't maybe look too inspiring. So as you see, and as I'm sure you know very well, uh, well, the one experiment that we have running currently in terms of interferometers is LIGO, Virgo, and Kagura collaboration. Uh, so here, this is a little bit outdated. There is already O3 uh, data, I believe, which came out, which is slightly better, but still no detection. So for us, uh, because this is a search for a, a stochastic process. So for us, this is actually an upper bound. Uh, and eventually over the years, uh, well, the sensitivity will be increasing until the, the experiments reach their uh, design goal. Uh, and as I'm sure you've heard, a lot of interesting things have been going on in the very low frequency regime, but we'll get there in a second. First, let's, uh, let's look at the prospects. Uh, so this is how the whole thing will look like in uh, 10 to 15 years. Well, maybe 15 rather than 10. But essentially, as you see, there is an improvement all over the board uh, in terms of laser interferometers and terrestrial experiments. We'll have uh, the next generation of experiments, so successors to LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra. Uh, the one I am showing in particular is the Einstein telescope, uh, which will be an underground experiment. This, should, this will be realized uh, somewhere in Europe. And it is already on the large infrastructure map of the European Union, which means it should be funded and hopefully soon. Although as far as I can tell, still there are there is no very definite timeline. Uh, but hopefully in the 2030s. Uh, 
we will have this increase. There is also an American experiment, uh, the Cosmic Explorer, with a similar sensitivity, which hopefully, if funded, will have a similar time frame. So, uh, large improvement. Now, if we want to uh, decrease the frequency at which we're probing, of course, that means a longer arm of our interferometer. And for millihertz, that already means we have to launch into space. And so I will, I will of course, mention LISA. I'm a part of the LISA collaboration also. I have been working on the experiment for uh, a couple of years already, well, in terms of theory, but still. Uh, so LISA, luckily, is already fully funded. It will be realized in the uh, scheduled time is 2035 uh, now, I believe. So just 13 years, and all of this part of the parameter space will be covered very nicely. OK, so then we go to even lower frequencies, again, meaning even longer arms uh, of, an, of our interferometers, and that pushes us into uh, pulsar timing territory. Uh, right, so the whole idea for detection here is quite different. Uh, essentially, what those experiments do is they uh, time the well the times of arrival of pulsars pulses from a pulsar meaning that well those are neutron stars which rotate and hit us with their beams uh well in every rotation um and the thing about them is that they are very stable by themselves so essentially by probing how often those pulses get to us uh, if the distance change, for example, due to passage of a gravitational wave, we would see that as, as Doppler shift of the uh, incoming time, times of pulses. Uh, well, but as you can see, we're not really in control of the experiment as well as we are if we just had our own interferometer. So there are a lot of noise sources, and this is in general a very difficult measurement. Uh, but still over the last, well, since 2020 uh, exactly, uh, there have been a lot of interesting data. So the first collaboration to come out and say that they maybe see something was nanograv. Uh, and essentially what they see well, is uh, uh, consistent with a gravitational wave signal in the sense that all the pulsar signals seem to be uh, modified in a way which would be consistent with a gravitational wave background being there. However, this is not confirmed. So um, the other thing that we expect from uh, pulsar timing uh, is this so-called hellings dons curve, essentially meaning that there should be a certain spatial cor correlation between pulsars. So essentially, if a gravitational wave is passing, well, through the slides, and, and one of the pulsars is moving like this, then the other one should be moving like that if it's a, a plus polarization. So they should be correlated uh, spatially in a non-trivial way, and that correlation has not been observed. So there's no proof that uh, the whole effect is coming from gravitational waves. Uh, but that's to be expected. Essentially, the problem is that the errors are still too big. So no correlation is still a reasonably good fit to the data. However, on the plus side, so since the nanograv report on this, uh, the other collaborations, so European Pulsar Timing Array and Parks Pulsar Timing Array also produce their data. They are not uh, too consistent in the sense that the amplitude roughly agrees, but the slope is very different. Uh, by the slope, I mean, um, so the data would be consistent with a gravitational, uh, stochastic uh, gravitational background. Uh, well, just going through the funnel. Uh, this is, well, my reinterpretation of the data. But as you see, so this is the International Pulsar Timing Array, the most recent, I think, addition. And as you see, the predicted slope is not exactly the same. There is a little bit of tension, but again, the errors are big. Uh, but this is to be resolved, hopefully. Actually, the International Pulsar Timing Array is a reanalysis of the older data. So before, this is from 11 and a half years, if I remember correctly, from Nanograph, the International Pulsar Timing Array reanalyzed the older data from all of the collaborations and again found the same process, which cannot be attributed to any noise source easily. Uh, well, but again, in a couple of years, hopefully the errors will, uh, will become smaller. The, accuracy will increase such that we'll be able to tell uh, if this was really a gravitational wave signal or not. It would, of course, be a very important discovery. Um, and last 
couple of experiments that I should mention, uh, because I'm also uh, working on those collaborations, is uh, slightly different kind of experiments. I don't really have a nice plot for them, sadly. They use a slightly different technology. So instead of using a uh, laser interferometer, instead of essentially shooting lasers between mirrors, what they do is they shoot lasers between mirrors, but there are bunches of cold atoms and it's then checking the state of those cold atoms uh, that will tell us what was the actual distance, how you know, well, what was the laser time of flight. Was a slightly different technology, as you see, the frequency is then a little bit different. Okay. Um, so there is the, the initial stage of this is the terrestrial uh, version of the experiment, so Aeon collaboration. So this is actually Aeon 100, which hopefully will be realized in a few years. Right now, a prototype, Aeon 10, is being assembled in Oxford. But there is actually a sibling experiment with an almost identical noise, uh, which is MAGIS, constructed in the US, and that one is actually already building a 100-meter version. So even though the technology is much newer and, say, less developed than laser interferometry, uh, it seems to also be well on its way, and hopefully by the 2030s we'll have a, a kilometer scale experiment, so Aeon Kilometer, that would be the largest terrestrial experiment that we have foreseen. And then hopefully by the 2050s, uh, the satellite incarnation of this experiment, uh, which we called EDGE, or maybe even EDGE Plus, so it's actually a part of our proposal for the Voyage 2050. So. Uh, uh, framework in the European Space Agency, which was supposed to pick uh, which experiments will be realized in the 2050s. And actually, the response was positive in the sense that one of the three large missions in the 2050s is supposed to be a probe of gravitational wave. No, I, I, I said too much. A, a probe of the early universe, which could either mean probably a probe of the CNB or another gravitational wave experiment. But still, uh, there are uh, very good prospects, even in this longer time frame, that we will have an, another experiment uh, aimed at probing the early universe. Okay, so enough of the experiments. Now let me tell you what you've seen in the plot, um, just because I will need to change variables in a second for, for a minute. So what I was showing you was the, the power law integrated sensitivity. This is quite different than the actual um, instantaneous sensitivity. So what the collaborations um, actually show you quite often in their, in their uh, predictions is um, strain sensitivity, for example. And um, so first, to get to that, we need to change variables to the abundance. And this immediately gives us an F to power 3. So this is actually in this example, the detector noise is just a straight line here. But then, I mean, uh, just a constant but we change variables, so we get this f to power three. And then what we do to get the power law integrated sensitivity is assume that our signals are all power laws. So basically it's just an amplitude and some power of f. And then we pick those amplitudes such that the signal to noise ratio that we get for each of them is the same. And in this example, equal to 10. Actually, in all the examples that I showed you equal to 10 meaning that we just do the integral and then find the amplitude, which gives us signal to noise ratio equal to 10 in each case. And this gives us this bunch of black lines that you see here. And the final step is to take an overlay of these, uh, which is in the end, the power law integrated sensitivity. And by this construction, you see that the definition is such that if a power law signal just touches the power law integrated sensitivity, uh, we have a detection because the signal to noise ratio is there. Um, now, the reason I have to say this is because I will have to change variables. This is a slightly different plot the, the, uh, in terms of characteristic strain. Uh, the reason I change variables is because I will say a few words about astrophysics, and this is more typical for uh, astrophysics to use variables such as characteristic strain. And again, the plot in terms of experiments is actually very similar to the previous one. The difference is that the, well, different variable and no power law integration. So these are instantaneous sensitivity curves of all of the experiments. 
Um, and then what I want to show you is how a signal from a binary, equal mass binary, looks like uh, in terms of those variables. So we have a few bunches, uh, 10 to 7 solar masses, 10 to 4. And the most interesting example, because we know that one actually exists, so say 10 to 100 solar masses, because this is just the population that LIGO is currently probing. Now, the important thing about this is that LIGO right now is mostly probing the spiral phase. This is actually the last bit here. Uh, when the binary is very tight, it produces a lot of gravitational waves, then collides, and then the signal, then there's ring down the signal, uh, well, ceases to be produced. But the important thing that I want to mention is that actually for a long time before that happens, the binary will be slowly in spiraling, tightening its uh, orbit, and producing gravitational waves at a much lower frequency. So for example, in this binary that LIGO would eventually see, uh, colliding, well, to get from here to here, it would take nine years. Then in another, well, 11 months, we would get here. And then as you see, this increases very quickly. So this is one hour from the merger and then the final merger is of course, uh, a split second. Uh, but the point is that each of those binaries, which we again know exist, will actually keep producing gravitational waves for a long time. Uh, and those will be weak point sources that are very difficult to identify. Now, um, the reason this will become important is that, of course, as you can imagine, uh, as the sensitivity increases, we'll also see more and more of those binaries even within LIGO itself, and eventually there will be so many signals that we won't be able to tell them apart. So essentially, at some point, we'll just start seeing well, the energy deposited in the detector. So essentially, just a stochastic process without being able to tell apart the different binaries. So to try and mimic how that would look like, let's go back to our usual variables and just integrate, um, well, using the rates that LIGO gave us, all the binaries uh, that will contribute to this, this foreground. So if we integrate literally all of them, we would get the gray line, which is very thin and is here. So this is the total foreground that the binaries would produce. But of course, immediately you will know that this is not really the correct result because LIGO already seen a few binaries, clearly identified them, and they are not contributing to any stochastic foreground. So this is the next step that we have to do. Uh, subtract the binaries that we can actually individually identify. So this is what we did in this plot uh, in a very simplified way in the sense that we only uh, take out from this stochastic foreground the binaries that each experiment will be able to see with a signal to noise ratio, which I believe was chosen to be eight here. And what this gives us is a slightly smaller foreground. So for instance, this is the result for LIGO. The error bands come from uh, our uncertainty on the rate, not really any uncertainty of the detectors itself. itself. Um, and of course we can play this game in any of the experiments. For example, the Einstein telescope, which has a better sensitivity, will be able to identify a whole lot more binaries and that, that leads to this, um, um, well, smaller signal, but as you see, this is only becoming a problem at lower frequencies. And the reason is exactly because their binaries are slowly in spiraling, essentially weak point sources. And as I showed you in the previous slide, around here, they can take decades to actually produce that, the, because what I showed you in the previous slide was the whole signal, the whole energy that will be produced at a given frequency. But the detector only runs for four years, so it won't even see that much. So identification there is really a lot more difficult, and you can see this by Lisa not being really able to identify uh, any of those binaries, pretty much. Um, all right, but this is, of course, not the whole story. This is not the end. It's true that there is this foreground, but as we've seen before, when we do the integrated power loss sensitivity, we can still see below that uh, quite often before I mean, below the instantaneous sensitivity. Uh, so we tried to do that with these data. So here the dashed lines are the good old power law integrated sensitivities as before. But what we did to try and show uh, what we can actually detect in presence of the foregrounds was to do Fisher analysis. So the signal was, this is the total signal. First, we have our 
primordial assumed, again, power law source, so exactly the same as with power law sensitivity. Uh, then we have the binary black hole mergers, so essentially the, the lines, the colorful lines that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, then there are binary white dwarfs, which are actually a part of uh, modeling of the LISA noise and um, somewhere around here for a long time. So we also included that for consistency. And then, of course, instrumental noise, which is always there for any experiment. Um, and for each of those signals, for each of the experiments, for a bunch of different power laws, we've been just trying to check what is the amplitude that we need to see the signal? And then again, just in the power law sensitivity case, uh, taking the envelope of all of them. And this is the result. So for LIGO, this is how the um, sensitivity will be cut. For ET, it's cut a lot less. Now, you see this is very bad for LISA in principle, because again, LISA cannot really distinguish those binaries very well. Uh, but this is also not the whole story. As you see, there are also the dot dashed lines. For Lisa, the dot dashed line is here. These come from assuming that the uncertainty on the rate, which is very important here, uh, will be lowered by a factor of 10, uh, which is not unreasonable to, to assume, given that Lisa will only launch in 13 years and observations will continue up until then. So if that happens, as you see, the sensitivity will actually be significantly better. There's also a difference uh, for edge, uh, but for other experiments, and this is the important part, uh, such as the Einstein telescope, you see hardly any difference. The line does show up a little bit. For BBO, it doesn't at all. And this is because these experiments will be able uh, to measure the rate themselves uh, very well. So it doesn't, this increase really doesn't help them at, at all. Okay, so this is uh, the impact of the stochastic foregrounds. Now, while this might seem bad, it's not horrible. For each experiment, as you see, we can lose up to maybe an order of magnitude uh, in sensitivity, but still uh, we'll be covering a whole lot of parameter space. So for this uh, up to 10 to minus 12, even if we don't actually uh, improve our knowledge on the range, which we surely will. It's just difficult to tell how much. Okay, so with this less but still optimistic prospects, uh, let's go over to the early universe. So, of course, the big idea here, or the very simple part of the idea is that, well, light-based sources were, of course, well, all the light signals were scattering uh, in the early universe up until recombination, which is good in the sense that we eventually got to see the CMB, uh, upon recombination when they stopped scattering, but bad because we can't really see anything directly beyond that. But of course, gravitational waves don't suffer from this, uh, from whenever they might be created, the signal will just propagate. Uh, and so this opens a new window into events before. Um, uh, before the universe became opaque. Okay, so. On to the actual sources, first order phase transitions. Um, what do I mean by a first order phase transition? Let's think of a very simple model potential. So this is just a polynomial potential. Uh, without even specifying the model, we can do a high temperature expansion. There are some unknowns because we don't really know the other particle content, but essentially we'll always have a T squared phi squared term. And that tells us that at very high temperature, the symmetry will be restored. So at very high symmetry, uh, we only have the uh, global minimum at zero. Now, as the temperature drops, this term will be becoming less and less important, and eventually a minimum, another minimum will develop. And a first order phase transition is the one where the barrier between the two is not negligible. If there was no barrier, and this minimum would simply start uh, developing from zero, essentially, or the barrier is too small and the field can just move through it, uh, none of this interesting would, stuff will happen. But if there is a barrier, then the field is still stuck at the origin. But as the temperature drops, the other minimum becomes deeper. And eventually we get to the deeper minimum through a tunneling event. So to tell you roughly how those calculations look like, but again, without going into too many details, 
Now, let, let me just tell you that essentially what we're doing is we're trying to solve uh, the equation of motion for the field such that, so again, here we have the field on both these axes. Here we have the potential. So this is actually the upper plot, but flipped. And we have a couple examples of different potentials. And then we have the solutions to the equation of motion. So what we do is we assume there is a spherical symmetry. If we're thinking of a thermally activated process, we just forget the time derivative. And so this is the usual radial coordinate in three dimensions. And then the solutions we're after are the ones where close to the origin of the coordinates, we are somewhere close to the true vacuum. And then as we go away uh, from the origin towards infinity, we end up in the background, which is the, the old phase. And essentially, we're just solving the equation of motion. So once we do that, of course, what we end up with is, is bubbles of the true vacuum in the background of the false vacuum. Um, okay. So now that we know this, uh, now we can discuss, uh, well, start thinking about gravitational wave production. So essentially, in this first phase, where we have a a bunch of bubbles nucleated, they are growing and expanding, but no gravitational waves are produced. Everything is spherically symmetric. So essentially, well, the spherical symmetry prohibits any gravitational wave production. But at some point, those bubbles will begin colliding, and then interesting things uh, uh, will begin to happen. So what are the key parameters there? First, uh, as you will always see in the literature, strength of the transition. Uh, always called alpha, which in a strong transition can be approximated as just the vacuum energy over radiation density. Uh, so it's, well, it's easy to see why this is called the strength of the transition. The other one is more complicated. It's usually called the time scale of the transition. Uh, and this is often called beta over h, but it actually has a much more intuitive interpretation, I think, which is the, it's simply connected to the average radius of a bubble. So this R star is literally the radius of the bubble upon collision and H, well, you can think of this as R over one over H. So essentially bubble size compared to the horizon radius. And this is quite understandable. It's just, well, the size of a bubble compared to the size of the horizon. And as you see, this is connected to the usual beta over H, so the time scale parameter, uh, just with a certain geometric factor in the power minus one. Of course, assuming that the wall velocity is one, but uh, we'll get to that soon. So there are a few different sources that have been uh, discussed over the years. <coughs> uh, well, most notably collisions of bubble walls and sound waves. This is the earliest source discussed. Uh, this is where most of the energy was going recently. Then there are perhaps other sources such as turbulence, but I put a question mark here because no one's ever really seen turbulence develop from a first, first order phase transition. So there are more and more works on how the spectrum would look like, but we don't really know what the amplitude would be. As you see, all of the other signals, they have very similar structure, alpha over alpha plus one. So this is essentially just vacuum energy density over the total, squared, appropriate length scale, squared, and that's true for all of them. Uh, but there's also an efficiency factor. So the collision efficiency factor, the sound wave efficiency factor, and this is the problem. For turbulence, uh, we cannot tell if the efficiency factor is bigger than zero. There were some estimates from the uh, Lisa Cosmology Working Group back in 2015, which essentially told us that each of these signals will have a, a different spectrum, and also that they can all play a role. Uh, but this is not really entirely the case. Uh, sorry, may I interrupt for a quick question? Sure. Uh, I've, uh, I, I'm familiar with the gravitational waves from the collisions, but uh, how, how do the sound waves work? What are, what are these and how do they produce uh, gravitational waves? How do they work? Okay, I, I hope I will answer this question uh, by the end of the talk. If I don't, we can get back to it at the end, okay? Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, so first let's let's go through what can those uh, constants be. So we, what's actually the mechanism producing gravitation waves? Um, <clears throat> and let's see some practical models because this is the important part. So let's start with the world's simplest extension of the, the standard model. So just a one non-renormalizable operator changing the potential h to power six. 
so we can go through with the calculation here uh well I didn't yet tell you how the calculation goes through but essentially the point is we are trying to check whether the bubbles uh, can still be accelerating by the time they collide or will thermal friction seize their acceleration if the thermal friction seizes their acceleration then the collision factor is of course negligible and the sound wave efficiency because essentially when the bubble stops accelerating all of the energy is going to the plasma shell around it so this is the result I will later show you how that's computed uh, a little bit but essentially for this model uh we can go through the whole parameter space for alpha well it extends there also but that's uh, it's less interesting and as you see collisions are essentially zero sound waves dominate the whole thing and the reason for the gray line here is that eventually we we, we tend to get into trouble with percolation this is always the case for polynomial potentials. Essentially, if there is an M squared parameter, that tells us when we should tunnel. If we end up just with a constant barrier, we will not tunnel at all. Vacuum domination will kick in, and then we will be producing more false vacuum than we are able to cover with bubbles. So from this point on, it starts to break down. The amount of false vacuum can still decrease at a time, but at least it's very shaky from this point on so when well alpha one means that the vacuum energy is much bigger than radiation background from this point on it doesn't work at all the vacuum energy does not decrease and this is a problem for all polynomial potentials I didn't even show it for the well the other model that I'll tell you words about standard model with an additional singlet scalar because there are more parameters and there is no one clear picture uh but it's this the uh, result is essentially the same alpha can only be close to one ish in this model um right but the reason I'm mentioning this is not really uh, just in terms of what alpha can be but rather what the wall velocity can be so we actually in the last few years went through this whole calculation that one always does for the um, electric barrier genesis uh, so we computed the transport equations, solved all, the, solved all the differential equations that tell us what are the uh, fluctuations on top of the plasma background, then tried to iteratively solve uh, the equations of motion. It's a very complicated procedure. I don't want to get into the details. I want to show you the final result because the well, there is a very important distinction, uh, which is, well, you can actually see it in the picture already. So these are the results, SMEFT and a singlet with well, a couple examples of masses and essentially what you see and what you would have expected for weak transitions the velocity is small then as the strength increases the velocity increases but this stops at some point uh, all of these lines as you see are cut at something which is called the Juliet velocity and to understand this we don't really need to go through the calculation because the, the reason for this is quite simple essentially uh, it has to do with the hydrodynamic solution that the fluid will have uh, for a given set of parameters. So the Juliet velocity is just some function of alpha, uh, but what is its meaning? So uh, we can compute the hydrodynamical solution for the fluid in presence of a bubble. This is again radius over time. So the 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 fluid is already uh, well. It's it's not accelerating. It's a self-similar solution. So r over t is a good variable. And in the example here, the strength is 0 0.05, as in all of them, the velocity is 0.45. As you see, what happens is that inside the bubble, there is some temperature, but crucially outside, we have this shell of heated fluid. So these are essentially the, this is what will continue propagating to be what is called sound waves, essentially. Uh, if the velocity is a little bit bigger, so 0.6, this is called a hybrid then, uh, because there is this little uh, refraction wave. But the key point is that there is still this shell of heated fluid outside the bubble. Now, if the transition is strong enough that we actually punch through to detonation, and this GK velocity tells us when, when this happens, when we go from a hybrid to a detonation, so this heated fluid shell disappears. And then the solution looks like this. So the bubble is only dragging some plasma behind it. Uh, and the reason this impacts the velocity is that the, the, the friction of the plasma, of course, depends on the temperature of the fluid. So as long as we have a, a heated fluid shell, 
This increases the friction. And at the time when we finally punch through this barrier, the temperature drops, the friction also drops. And the result is that we don't, in this calculation, get to see the friction rise beyond what it was just below this line, so somewhere here. Essentially meaning that our approximations break down before we can compute the wall velocity. But we can at least check that the wall velocity will be very close to one. So essentially, all the solutions that we'll find, maybe I have this here, yes. So there's a very nice analytical approximation that we uh, shown in this paper. Uh, which, well, is not uh, brilliant in terms of accuracy, it's maybe up to 10%, but it very easily allows you to check, because those are all simple parameters, alpha, delta V, and rho R. Again here, uh, alpha has this thermal contribution, so this is not always just one, as, as it would be with the previous definition. But essentially, this allows you to check uh, whether the velocity is below as you get or above, and that way you can get a feel for at what alpha this happens because this is the key thing. As you see in this plot, this all has happened for quite weak transitions at alpha equal to 0.1. Now, why is this important? Because when we plot all of the gravitational wave signals that we can expect from this uh, with those slow walls, essentially they are not really observable. So this is the SMEF model. Uh, this is the neutral scalar with a few different masses. Again, velocity is only up to the velocity. As you see, weak signals that we don't really hope to observe. This is a, a newer paper where we did the non zeta symmetric scalar and we did a large scan of the parameter space, more lines. But again, those are only the walls uh, that cease to accelerate below the Juget velocity. For all of these models, it is, of course, true that you will also have much stronger signals from I'm a stronger sorry. transition. I'm sorry, I have one simple question. Well, the number of the MS means that the year of the thermal history of the cosmology, number of MS. So you distinguish the MS is uh, 170 GB or something that, yes, yeah, the right, the right hand side. Yeah, the number of MS is related to the uh, some year in thermal history of cosmology. So this is just the mass of the singlet scalar in the neutral scalar model. I see. And you, uh, which euro in cosmology uh, you think for the first to the phase transition is uh, near the electroweak scale? Or which uh, euro in cosmology do you think for the first to the phase transition in, in thermal history of cosmology? So in this model, it's always very close uh, to the electroweak transition, but we'll also have more general models later on. But in this model, yes, it's always, I mean, that's why the frequency is always kind of the same, because this is all very close to the um, standard model characteristic temperature. And one more question. If you think about the electroweak phase transition euro, the first order is very weak, not strong. So it may depend, it may affect the velocity of the uh, back in the world, but you did not. Okay, you 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 did not care about this one. You just uh, check the different several kind of the uh, world with a different velocity of the yeah for the back in the world when the colliding. Well, yes. So in the in the standard model, the transition is second order. Nothing like that happens there. So this is not really of a lot of interest. Uh, that's why we always deal with extensions. That's why I don't talk about the standard model itself at all. Uh, so let me reiterate again that there are much stronger transitions in those models uh, that will give you observable signals, but all of them share this quality that the velocity will be then pretty much equal to one. Okay, and this is, uh, this is quite important. Let me also tell you that this result is quite difficult to change because as, as you pointed out, well, essentially the friction is coming from whatever constitutes the plasma at the time of the transition. So around the electroweak phase transition, we pretty much know what it is. It's difficult to couple a new particle which would still contribute uh, and increase the friction such that we can have stronger transitions with smaller velocities, uh, but th that we wouldn't see it in a collider already. Okay, but uh, let's go over to 
Okay, so will the wall eventually stop? This is uh, an interesting question, which will have to do with the bubble collisions later on. So essentially, if we assume that the wall is very thin, we can write down its energy. So this is the surface term, R squared times, well, some tension of the wall and the gamma factor of the wall. And then we have the volume term. So essentially radius to power three, uh, that's the, uh, the obvious factor. And then, so from the earlier times, uh, people knew that there is, of course, vacuum pressure. This is essentially negative pressure that is accelerating the wall's growth. Uh, but then there is the thermal contributions. So these are less obvious. Uh, so this is dealing with relatively strong transitions. And if you think about those, at least at first order, it seems that the correction, the first correction is constant uh, because this all happens quite fast. So during the transition, you can assume that the temperature is constant. So then it would seem, and that was the case in the Lisa review in 2015, uh, that the walls can run away. But this is not really true. Uh, in 2017, there was the update. Uh, as it turns out, soft boson emissions uh, as particles cross the wall actually give you a correction, which is now proportional to gamma. So as the wall accelerates, gamma increases, eventually this will begin to dominate and then the wall will cease to accelerate. The only question is, is that if this will happen before uh, the walls collide, because if not, uh, then the wall still will be accelerating and a lot of energy will be deposited into the uh, velocity of I mean, in the, to the acceleration of the wall. Now, there's some discussion about this. Uh, maybe you've heard about this. So there was this update by Jorge saying that this first correction is actually gamma squared, but then there was another report saying in 21 that it's still gamma. We actually looked at both. And in terms of, because the, uh, as you see, the constant is also different. There isn't that big of a difference in practice in terms of model parameter space, uh, because essentially what we're dealing with here is we need extremely strong transitions to get into this regime. So again, computing the efficiency just by calculating the integral of the, the, the energy deposited using the expression for the friction, what we get, and this is a different model example, which I'll get to, as you see, as the strength increases, the collision efficiency does increase, because essentially what we're trying to do is super cool the transition, lower the temperature, because that lowers the friction. Of course, if we can still be in the false vacuum and lower, keep lowering the temperature, eventually the friction will be low enough that the walls can keep on accelerating. But this takes an extremely strong transition. So here, if it, of course, alpha tend to, so bubble collisions will dominate only when alpha is say 10 to power 12. So an extremely strong transition with a prolonged vacuum domination. And the only models that are capable of still finishing the transition in this setting are the classically scaling variant models. So essentially at three level, you only have lambda phi to the fourth. Then there is some running of lambda, which is actually producing the minimum at, at uh, large value of the field. And then the uh, barrier is only produced due to thermal effects. This is the only kind of model that can actually support this and not run into the problems with percolation that we've seen in polynomial potentials. Okay, so in the last uh, negative three minutes, uh, gravitational wave spectrum calculation. So <laughs> what we do is we do a 3D simulation. Uh, oh no, that's great. I still have positive 10 minutes actually. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, I still 15 minutes, I think about her. Yeah. Ah, okay, so much not, time. Not oh, I started worrying. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So this is a terrible plot, but I didn't really have time or uh, skill to do a better one. Essentially, what we do in the simulation to compute the gravitational waves is assume that we have a bunch of hard spheres that nucleate. We nucleate them randomly. This is all done in 3D, but these are spheres. So we don't, this is not a lattice simulation. We just keep track of where the wall is. And the key question is what happens when the walls collide? This picture is terrible enough that it doesn't even attempt to uh, give you an answer. Uh, but the actual answer for the practical calculation uh, that we will give comes from uh, essentially lattice simulations. So on the lattice, uh, well, if you do a symmetric situation, so here we, what we did is we assumed, uh, uh, what is that called? 
Well, we assume there is a, a symmetry along one axis, right? So that's why we have the radius here. But this z-direction uh, was kept as a, as a parameter such that, as a coordinate, such that we can actually nucleate two bubbles. But this is still much simpler than actually trying to do lattice in 3D, which would limit, uh, well, the energy of the walls that we can achieve. This is a big numerical problem, because essentially what happens in this initial stage, we nucleate some bubbles that we again have from our solution to the equation of motion way uh, above. Uh, and then we just run it on the lattice. One yes. question, is it difficult to see the uh, vertical axis, so what is that axis, sorry? So what is this uh, vertical axis that you have? What are the axes? Yes, so this is the radius, so we have a symmetry along one axis. Mm -hmm. So this is essentially a cylinder, and this is showing what you what's going on around uh, when you cut through the ray, uh, such that you see the radius from the axis. The other one is just Z, so along the axis. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so this is essentially a cylinder, but this is a cut through it, uh, right through the middle. Okay, thank you. Uh, but, well, this is the way to, to be able to nucleate two bubbles. If we had radial symmetry, then we can only do one bubble, which is, it's difficult to see a collision then. Okay, so during this initial stage, Essentially, we start with our solution to the equation of motion, and then we let it run. What happens is, of course, the bubble grows. And then, as you see, so this is the logarithmic energy density, I should say. So this is the false vacuum energy. And then inside, the energy is lower, of course. You know, so as you see, the energy of the, uh, the wall increases, so it's becoming thinner and more energetic. And then upon collision, something interesting happens. Well, of course, uh, the energy will essentially keep on propagating. This is not the best example because some of the energy was left here, but in more realistic, uh, more energetic collisions, well, the more energetic a collision is, actually the more you will just see the energy propagating where the wall would have been. But of course, given that we're not converting the vacuum anymore, the energy will begin to decrease. And the question is, how uh, uh, does it decrease? because this is exactly what we will then be then putting into our hard spheres, a uh, very simplified simulation. Now, back in the day, people computed the signal using the so-called envelope approximation, which just assumed none of this was here. It simply assumed that after the walls collide, they disappear completely. So the collided parts of the spheres were just taken away. Uh, but this is not a very good approximation. Let me skip this. Uh, in practice, what will happen, well, again, you do the same simulation. This is actually the same plot, just shown a little bit differently. Uh, so this is the z-axis. I'm not showing what's going on around the r-axis. Uh, but as you see, those are just growing bubbles. Here, time goes by, so the bubbles simply grow. And we have two of them. They collide at some point, well, at the origin of, of the, the z-axis. And depending on the various parameters that we have here, as you see, the energy dissipates either more slowly or more quickly. So what changes here? Uh, in this simulation, G, so the, uh, the gauge coupling was zero. So this is just a pure scalar. This is technically the abelian Higgs model, but if you set the gauge coupling to be zero, then it's just a scalar uh, with no gauge symmetry. And this actually impacts uh, the result a lot. So this is the maximum of the energy that you will actually then, in the end, put uh, in the energy momentum tensor to compute gravitational waves. Again, computed at the shell. So this is time over TC, but this is always computed at this uh, line, where the wall first is and then would have been after the collision. Uh, so for g equal to zero, as you see, the scaling is slower, and this actually goes as r to power minus two, which would correspond to a global symmetry breaking. But if we in increase the coupling, of course, the coupling isn't 10. This is a sort of scaled coupling with v squared and delta v. And actually, uh, g, g equal this g tilde equal to 10 gives you a reasonable uh, potential in which the transition is strong. So this is a very reasonable choice of the parameters. 
And then what you see uh, is that the scaling is different. Uh, the energy essentially, well, because you produce a bunch of gauge bosons, dissipates as r to power minus three. Uh, so this is what we get from the lattice simulations and we can put back into our hard spheres model. But before we do that, let's talk about plasma again. So as you know, uh, well, historically, at least this, these calculations of sound waves that I promised I will eventually discuss to some extent, they were mostly done on the lattice. But essentially on the lattice, what you do, um, well, okay, you solve the system of the fluid and the, and the field, but essentially you come up with, let me, let me go back to this a little bit, to those things. Before the collision, you find solutions looking like this, essentially the hydrodynamical solutions. The thing is that then when you have two walls which collide, again, they don't carry a whole lot of energy. This is not that important, uh, but those heated fluid shells will continue to propagate and produce gravitational waves. This is essentially what uh, sound wave production of gravitational waves is. Uh, well, with the only difference that, of course, in lattice realizations, this was always done for rather weak transitions. So essentially, kind of around here, uh, up to 0 0.05, I think. Uh, and the reason is, of course, this is becoming, again, just as with uh, our simulations of walls, a nightmare numerically. Uh, the stronger the transition would be, the bigger these jumps, and essentially the more accuracy you need. So at, in 3D, this is becoming untangible very quickly. Um, but we can try and think of this in a simplified way again. Um, so how do the profiles look like? I already told you that we should mostly be interested in walls that are fast. So the velocity is above Jaguar velocity. The strength, well, actually strength of 0.2 is also fine and the velocity would be one, but I'm trying to show you that what happens when you increase the strength of the transition is that this uh, profile of the fluid is becoming more and more peaked, uh, right? And of, of course the jump is again where the wall is, so this is essentially giving you the velocity of the wall. Uh, and this strange parameter here is, again, could be translated just to this T that we had. This is what goes in to the energy momentum tensor that we'll use uh, to compute gravitational waves. But this is given in terms of the fluid parameters and so the fluid velocity, the gamma coming from that velocity and then the enthalpy of the fluid. Uh, but these are all things that we can uh, track on the lattice. Well, actually, this initial profile we can calculate analytically, just like I did back in the previous slides. But we can then track what it does later on on the lattice. So what was done here, and this was actually one of the main results of the uh, lattice simulations back in the day, that essentially those fluid shells essentially keep on propagating sort of freely. They pass through each other. They don't really interact for a long time. Uh, so using this knowledge, what we can do is simulate uh, a much stronger transition than you could do on 3D. So for example, alpha here is 20 and gamma of the wall is 50. So the velocity is uh, 0.9998 something. Uh, so a very, uh, very energetic transition. Uh, and what we do here is we just remove the wall and then keep tracking what the fluid shell itself would do if it's not pushed forward by anything. We also checked using uh, 1D simulations that the actual collisions of the fluid shells themselves don't do anything. They pass through each other. There isn't any, really any interaction to speak of. So in this simulation, we simply just get rid of the wall and see what the fluid will do after the collision. And as you see, what it does is uh, simple, actually quite simple. Uh, so firstly, you see that the fluid for those extremely strong transitions is very peaked. Uh, this is again, uh, yeah, those are profiles uh, in terms of the radius and different colors give you the time. So this, is, this red one is essentially the initial one. The initial one is very peaked, as you see. Uh, so it's not unreasonable to think of it as just energy deposited at radius, well, r equal to something. Uh, and again, so we're back to our hard spheres model. And then as the time goes by, we see that those profiles essentially, well, the energy dissipates, but it again dissipates in this very simple manner, r to power minus three. 
Uh, so the energy dissipates. One other thing that I should mention here is that as you see, the profile in at time three got all the way up to radius equal to three. And this means it continues to propagate uh, as a relativistic shock, you could say. Because in practice, what the fluid will do when it relaxes, and this was also a part of the, the sound wave model for obvious reasons that I will get to. Um, so if we do the same thing for a weaker transition, this is still relatively strong, but, but weaker than the, than the previous slide. So alpha is 0.5, the wall velocity is 0.93, I think, so gamma equal to 3. So first, the fluid is less peaked, of course. There is a, a, so the shell is, is thicker. The scaling is still r to power minus 3, but the other important thing is that you can see the, the in time of 3, those shells only got here. And this is to be expected because actually for a weak transition, uh, what typically happens is that the velocity of those fluid shells will very quickly relax to the speed of sound in the plasma. There's nothing uh, pushing the fluid still, so it, will it should relax to the speed of sound. And indeed here it does. So the speed of sound is one over square root of three, so 0.57. So in time of from one to three, uh, it should travel a distance of 1.4 ish, which it pretty much did. So as you see, for weaker transitions, the velocity uh, quickly changes uh, to the speed of sound. Uh, but the scaling is similar. The, the main problem with trying to use the hard spheres model uh, when computing the gravitational wave signals uh, is that, as you see now, the shells are becoming less and less peaked. So eventually, of course, for alpha equal to 0.1, the hard sphere model will give you a terrible result because we're neglecting the width uh, of the fluid shells. But essentially, for all the strong transitions, so alpha stronger than 1, it should work reasonably well. So knowing all this, we just do our hard spheres, compute the gravitational wave spectrum from that, and get to the final result, which is uh, the resulting spectrum is a broken power law. So there is, uh, well, A, B, and C are the parameters. C basically gives you the width of the peak. A is the low frequency slope, and B is the high frequency uh, tail. OK, so there are a bunch of examples that I will talk about during the talk. So first, bubble collisions global symmetry breaking, so no gauge fields. Then R goes as uh, uh, the energy dissipates as R to power minus two. And you can see this is a very, this stands out. Uh, because essentially, if the energy dissipates slower, that means at larger, yes, at larger uh, scales, meaning lower frequency, we get a lot more energy. And this is why, uh, it drops significantly slower than the other uh, results. But the high frequency tail, uh, so B is close to two, essentially. Uh, right, I also mentioned the envelope, which has the opposite problem in, in a sense, because there you just remove all the large scale contributions. And as you see, indeed, it is cut uh, it is the most steep of the whole of the all re, of all the results. Oh, I didn't even write down, but essentially it's three. The, the power here would be three, while all the other results have uh, a slope of two point four, uh, two point three ish. This is what A is. Um, all right. So where I'm trying to get with this. Uh, so the main message I think is. So, of course, the gauged bubbles is the thing you would actually expect uh, from a transition strong enough to produce a bubble collision signal. And these people knew pretty much. They, they weren't really quite sure what the spectrum would be because people still sometimes use the envelope result, which is not very good. But essentially, uh, the green line is known to occur at alpha equal to 10 to 12 or something like that. In, in extremely strong transitions. Now, what we argue for is that when you have uh, the fluid shells that propagate as relativistic shocks, 
actually the calculation is kind of the same. It looks almost the same. The parameters are, and as you see, the result is almost identically the same. It's the dot dashed red line. Essentially, all the differences are within errors that we could just get from, uh, well, not enough simulation time. Even those simplified simulations take a long time on a cluster uh, to get to this accuracy. Sorry, one quick question. I miss uh, what is the meaning of this parameter A that you have there? A? Uh -huh. The capital, the ca capital A. Oh, big A, amplitude. Uh -huh. I just amplitude. So, but so uh, this gives you, yes. Okay. <laughs> but this actually, as you see, this turns out uh, to almost always. So this is a is actually well a few times ten to the power minus two. Well, here it's six, five, five, four. But even for the sound wave simulations, I think they got 0 0.012. So also, well, a little bit less. But same order, ten to minus two ish. Mm -hmm. So, so this always kind of turns out the same. Uh, the real difference. That's why I can plot them all in one in one figure. Uh, the real difference comes from the slopes. Uh, so again, this was quite well known for a good few years. But we're now trying to argue, and this is the result from just this August, that relativistic fluid shells will pretty much produce the same spectrum. So when you go with alpha from 10 to the 12, all the way up to 10 or even a few, the spectrum will still be the same. It will be what we used to call the bubble collision spectrum. And only later on, where we enter the regime of weaker transitions, where the fluid velocity changes to the speed of sound, you will start seeing that the spectrum is being modified. And indeed, you, well, you see this here, uh, because the slope at high frequency becomes different, the amplitude begins to drop. Uh, but as I said, essentially, this method will not really work for very weak transitions where alpha is less than one, uh, because then the width of the fluid shells is non negligible, and this doesn't really recreate the full result. But anything above that should work reasonably well. And then, well, we can only start with this. And quite quickly for alpha equal to a few, uh, go to the relativistic fluid result, which is exactly the same as the bubble uh, collisions result. Uh, so this is, well, this is, I think, the main message of the talk. People used to think that there is something dramatic happening when you switch from plasma-related production to bubble-related production. But there really isn't. It seems that the result will largely be the same, and the actual difference happens uh, around alpha equal to one, where the fluid dynamics begin to play more of a role rather than just simply scaling of the energy. Mm -hmm. Right, so that was the main message, and I, with this I'm ready to conclude. So uh, gravitational waves, this was the first part, which is important. Uh, the gravitational wave string signals strong enough to be observed can only be produced in transitions with, which have relativistic walls. So this is what people always did in the literature, not wanting to compute the wall velocity in their models, which is always quite difficult. They would put the velocity equal to one, and it turns out that they were pretty much right a lot of the time. You just need to cut alpha to not be too small, and then you're fine. This is a completely fine result, uh, which is uh, a little bit ironic, but uh, so the results were correct. And then the other important thing, as I kept trying to stress observable bubble collision signal are produced only in extremely strong transitions, so alpha 10 to power 10 or so, but also fluid shells in strong transitions, so alpha bigger than one would produce the exact same spectrum. And in fact, uh, in this regime, you can see that alpha over alpha plus one sort of, well, it just goes to one, stops in impacting the amplitude, so then we can produce this nice plot with less parameters because now we're only left with two, the size of the bubbles uh, and the reheating temperature. So the temperature that the system will reach after the transition, the highest temperature. Um, and as you see, so the temperature pretty much dictates uh, what is the frequency because just through the redshift. <clears throat> and indeed, uh, if, the, if the reheating temperature is uh, say 100 GeV, so electric transition, of course, LISA, but then if we go to higher temperatures that goes to, um, 
well, higher frequency Einstein telescope, also LIGO, although the reach is a little bit limited, of course, and, and higher on. And conversely, if we go to lower uh, reheating temperatures, we go to lower frequencies, and we can even fit the nanograv result uh, semi-successfully. So uh, here in this part, uh, this is actually excluded because it's already above the results. So uh, pulsar timing arrays are excluding this part. Within this blob, which is uh, vaguely visible, I hope, we get a two sigma result. And within this smaller blob, a one sigma fit. So we can fit the result. But the problem there that people know of, and this was visible when people were trying to explain the nanogram results uh, two years ago, this is very close to BBN. This plot actually uh, strategically ends at 5 MeV. Uh, so this is exactly where BBN happens. And of course, if there is a phase transition actively occurring during BBN time, it will have uh, surely have some impact on the resulting abundances of elements. So uh, this is not really allowed, especially for strong transitions. So this is why we, we have a hard cut here. And even this region here is a little bit questionable. But certainly, electroweak transition and higher scales are, are very valid. And indeed, our well, our reach will be pretty good uh, as long as the bubbles aren't more than three orders of magnitude below the horizon size in in scale. So essentially, con which essentially uh, conversely means that the transition has to be strong enough again, because the stronger the transition, the larger the bubbles. Uh, okay, and this is actually all that I had for you. For you, thank you for your attention. Yeah. We are now open uh, for questions, please. Yaron, maybe you, you want to ask your question again? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, sorry, for, uh, forgive me, I didn't uh, really uh uh see where you discussed the the issue of the sound waves could you explain this again i mean what's uh kind of oscillating there uh oh what's oscillating no i, I mean what's, uh, uh, what's what uh, where uh, a sound wave means uh, there's some uh, uh density perturbation moving moving around no uh, and so i'm wondering is that inside the bubbles or outside and uh yeah, so what's going on here? Oh, so this just corresponds to those profiles, essentially. This is, so this is the enthalpy. That means that the density is actually also bigger here. So you have over densities that are propagating. I think that's all there is to it. I see. And well, inside the bubbles or uh, between the bubbles or just everywhere? <laughs> so this is, uh, this is already after the collision, as I said. So as the bubble grows, it will reach some sort of finite velocity, usually in those models, and that will give you this initial profile. So this is, well, this is temperature, but it can be translated into density if you just take the well, uh, one over fourth oh. power. <laughs> right, so we oh, have okay. some so this is a over density there. Uh -huh. And then what happens, uh, as I tried to explain, when the two walls collide, they don't really carry a lot of energy. So nothing super interesting happens. And the shells themselves, they also just pass through each other. So you will have those propagating over densities. And they will essentially, in my terrible plot, which I'm not proud of this one, they will keep looking like this, sort of. But the mm -hmm. energy will begin to decrease after the collision has occurred. Uh, essentially just following these uh -huh. plots. So this is after the collision as the radius grows. So this is not the best approximation because I just assumed that the wall entirely disappears uh, in, in one moment. And then we, we're looking at what's, uh, what's happening with the, the fluid shell. But as you see, as, as time goes by, it grows as we, as we would expect, keeps on propagating, and then it just loses energy because there is nothing pushing it anymore. Essentially, before the time of collision, you would see the exact same profile uh, earlier on, because this is a self-similar profile. And then the gravitational waves 
uh, essentially are these uh, fluctuations after they you know, propagate around the universe or does how does uh, how's the connection between the sound wave and the gravitational wave what is the connection well so essentially this thing is quite massive it carries a lot of energy so you have a bunch of um, quickly moving uh, masses this is what is producing gravitational waves for you ah uh, okay And you also have significant, I mean, enough acceleration of those masses that you, you know, that you get the gravitational waves. Yes. Well, it's deceleration here actually, but yes, it's. Uh... Uh, yeah, negative acceleration. Fair. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. I think there are. That's uh, sounds uh, reasonable. Thank you. Any other question? No? Well, I have uh, one question. So you, um, I think you did all these calculations about the wall velocity in the context of, uh, yeah, phase transitions at the electroweak, uh, close to the electroweak um, uh, energy. So, you mm -hmm. know, there are, there are many, um, uh, models beyond the standard model, in particular granular five theories uh, for which the temperature is more higher. But I wonder how do your um, results translate into these very high uh, energies? So, we, or is it, I mean, is there an easy way to translate them? But, uh... Can you say again, what kinds of models are you thinking of? Yes, for example, uh, phase transitions at, uh, uh, at the order of the uh, grand unified scale. Oh, at the Gat scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so will a whole lot of, well, it's kind of difficult to say, to be honest, uh, but essentially you would expect pretty much a similar picture in the sense that you will still have plasma <clears throat> uh, enacting some friction. It depends on what exactly constitutes the plasma that will give you how uh, big the friction is. Uh, but it's still always true uh, that as the strength of the transition increases, the velocity of the walls will also increase because then you always dilute the, the underlying plasma. So it, it does depend on the, the particle content of the plasma. And actually for a gut scale transition, it's quite difficult to say, but I would expect something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, unless you have a whole lot of new degrees of freedom, then the, the picture will be quite similar. If you change the number of degrees of freedom in the plasma by an order of magnitude or so, then maybe you can still have relatively slow walls uh, for larger strengths of the transition. Uh, this is something that Mark Heimarsh was working on quite a lot, although I don't think he ever really gave an example model. Uh, but essentially, if there are a whole lot more degrees of freedom, then you can still expect slower walls uh, for relatively strong transitions. But the electroweak scale, that would be very difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, in these models, uh, people do, as you said, just put the, the wall velocity equals to one, because it's very difficult to compute it. So you just... Uh, I'm wondering if it's uh, really the right thing to do, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure that at least for the strongest transitions that you can find, if alpha is significant, uh, then it's probably a reasonably good expectation. Uh, it's actually very difficult. So there was this paper by Mark Heinmarsh where they found, they were trying to go into the opposite regime where they have a relatively strong transition, but a relatively slow wall actually still looking kind of like a deflagration here. So they actually had uh, alpha equal to 0.5, I think, and the velocity was 0.45. And what they find is that then, because this is, there is a whole lot of friction in the system, and this is killing the gravitational wave signal. Uh, so if you would be in this regime, then that's really bad because that really kills the, the signal because this is all uh, 
you know, everything is very slowed down by this very high friction that the plasma emits and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I'm curious about this uh, uh, the scalar extension model. So, so this kind of scalar extension models, uh, they are very we good for this variogenesis purpose. This fast order phase transition variogenesis. So, what kind of so so the so the detectability of this kind of model through gravitational wave, what, what kind of detection prospect we can expect? Let's say the parameter space which produces correct uh, baryon asymmetry, and and those parameter space can we get us uh, can we access those parameter space through gravitational wave signal? Uh, so actually, that's a problem that I was trying to sweep under the rug uh, because the thing is. We can only compute baryon yield before we reach the Jiguet velocity. As I said, once we go through, we don't, we are not able to find the parameters of the wall anymore. So we don't really find uh, the baryon yield, but we would expect it to decrease significantly because what happens, yeah, I don't really have this in the plot, but as the velocity increases here, the baryon yield also increases, which is quite interesting. And it's actually top right about right below the Juliet velocity but this is because the temperature outside keeps increasing due to this heated shell uh, now the problem is once you cross the Juliet velocity i would expect you don't really produce any baryons to be honest at least not in this very standard uh, electric baryogenesis mechanism so essentially the well, I tried to sketch this division between fast walls and slow walls, but you could just as well say fast walls with gravitational wave production or slow walls with barrier medium. And these do not, those are separate uh, uh, parts of the parameter space, I'm afraid. Yeah, so I any other uh, question, comment? No. So, uh, from the Zoom audience. Okay. So I think we, uh, yeah, we're ready to finish then. So thank you again very much for the very nice uh, talk, and we hope that you uh, could send uh, uh, the slide so we can learn more. So yeah. Okay. Thank you then.